that's why it's there. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we're we're now live, um, and thank you to everybody who is joining us from around the world. Um, you're uh, surprised we're seeing Stephen Ringler today instead of Latch. Uh, he's out on holiday, so I'm stepping in for him. Uh, so nice for everybody to be joining us. Uh, we've got a special treat tonight. Uh, I'm joined with Mariela Kiers, uh, where I've been practicing her name for a while. She's from the Netherlands joining us. So how are you doing tonight, Mariela? I'm doing great. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. So um, tell us before we, before, we're going to just give it a couple minutes before people, you know, kind of get on the uh, uh, on the show, just tell us uh, in a summary of a couple of sentences, what, what are we going to talk about tonight? What, what's your passion? Yeah, t tonight we're going to talk about GIS and the title of the show today will be uh, GIS for all. Because uh, when I explain what GIS is, people always think that oh, it's very hard. It's nothing for me. It's only for experts. But that's totally not true. You can uh, start with it very easy. And even children can enjoy GIS. So that's what today's show is about. I give some examples about how experts can use it, but also how you can use it at home or at school. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, I I love that because with here at Space Store, we believe we our whole motto is bringing space to everyone, uh, bringing space experience to everyone. So. Having um, having that on your end, um, you know, with GIS and wanting to bring it for all, uh, it just fits in perfectly. Well, with that, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Um, so, uh, I guess just to just to kind of kick things off, um, what what is GIS? Maybe um, you know, some people might be wondering what in the world does that even mean. Um, can you tell us what GIS is? Of course I can. Uh, GIS uh, stands for Geographic Information Systems. And technically, it's, it's something like uh, a system designed for uh, capturing and manipulating, analyzing, managing, uh, and, and finally visualizing uh, data uh, in maps, for example. Okay. So... So maybe if I were to, to, to put it in another way, or just for, for you know, some of us that maybe don't know GIS as well as you, I mean, it, so, it sounds a little bit like basically maps with lots of information on them that tell us something, something useful. Is that kind of, kind of right? Yes and no. Uh, most of the time it's about maps with information on it, but uh, no more information uh, that fits the purpose. So you only put the information on the map you really need for uh, the subject of the map. Awesome. So don't bother everyone with all the information you have because most of the time uh, the reader sees a map, but that's not all the information which is behind the map. Okay. All right. Wow. So you so have to filter which part will I show the, uh, the reader of the map and which part I won't show them. Okay. So Got if it. you want to, to explain someone where uh, China is located, you don't uh, take a road map with a, with a scale like uh, one on 10,000 uh, to point out where uh, China is. Then it's only necessary to have the borders of countries or maybe even the continents. Got it. So it's almost like tailoring the information for what the person needs to know. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Well, let me, I, I'll tell a little bit to the viewers tonight. Um, I, uh, I met uh, Mariella, um, I think it was over the first lockdown a few, uh, few months back. And yes. what really um, uh, struck me uh, about you, Mariela, is just your, your, your passion and your excitement about GIS. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you can um, tell us a little bit more about, about you and uh, who you are and where your passion for GIS comes from. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm pretty new in the world of GIS. Uh... I uh, changed careers uh, only one and a half year ago. Before that, uh, I was uh, for over 24 years a high school teacher in mathematics and physics. And uh, sometimes you come in a 
position in your life and, and then you start thinking, is this what I want to do for the next 20 years? And some call it a midlife crisis or something like that. But I was in that position and uh, I thought, oh, is this what I want to do for the next 20 years? Because we have to work longer and longer. And I didn't dislike my job, but sometimes you think, oh, I want to do something else. And what do I really love about my work and what I'm always desiring for? And I, I love numbers. I, I, as a child, I was fascinated by maps and uh, I like to do analyzes. So when you add this all together, it ends up with uh, GIS. So then I, I uh, took the switch and, and one and a half year ago, I started to, uh, yeah, to change my career. And I, I did an education in it. Uh, I went to school again. And uh, I like, like uh, January f uh, 2019, I have never heard of this GIS. So it was completely new to me uh, also. Wow. Wow, that's so cool. Well. I know that you have just gotten so involved in it. You're part of a talk show. You, you're active on Twitter. Uh, you do so much in the community in the Netherlands for uh, for GIS and around the world. And we'll get we'll get into all that tonight. Um, I think what, maybe what we could do to start is uh, let's let's share some examples. Let's start to talk to um, our audience about what it is. Like what what yes. are some some uh, some simple examples? So. Um, you had you you told me about this really interesting one earlier that I just think is just so fascinating. I didn't even realize that GIS has been around for for a long time. Actually, it's been around before we even had satellites, and you know, yes, yes. We like satellites. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe the first the first GIS uh, activity? Yeah, one of the first GIS uh, GIS activities uh, started in London, actually during the, the big uh, cholera uh, epidemic. You know what I mean, <laughs> the cholera disaster. And uh, John Snow, uh, he was a doctor in London and he started to um, point all the, the cholera cases on a map. So he pointed them and he noticed that they were all in, in a certain area. Mm. Uh, it was clustered around uh, a pump, a water pump. Mm. And then uh, he figured out that it wasn't uh, something like uh, bad spirits or all the, the weird things people believed in uh, these days. Eh? It was uh, 1854, so they had some really dangerous beliefs. And, uh, but by doing his analysis, he was actually doing the first, uh, one of the first GIS analyses on a map. Yeah. And maybe it's nice that you show the picture of yeah, it. We, you're right. You, uh, you brought actually a picture of this map. So let yes. the audience to, uh, show them this. I mean, I, I think this is fascinating. Talk us through what we're looking at here. Yeah, on, on the left, you see uh, the original map of Jon Snow. And on the right, I use the data of, of Jon Snow's uh, study. And I made uh, the map how it would look nowadays. So with the same data, uh, a map of cholera uh, would look like the one on the right. And you see whether there is more uh, red color, where it's darker. There are more cases. Hmm. And now you see very clearly that it's situated around the pump in the middle of the big red circle. And uh, that pump was infected with the cholera. So when they closed the pump over there, uh, the, there was a big uh, decrease of, of cholera in the area. So that's a great way of using GIS uh, for uh, health purpose. You know, it's so strange that this is the, the first GIS map that existed and, and you fast forward to today and mm -hmm. we're in a global pandemic. And I think there's a lot of analogies that potentially you could use or see from this, this map. Um, you know, it, you know, you talked about 
pumps. So, you know, looking at this map, you see these different blue pumps. And I could imagine that there's other, other factors now in our society, uh, whether that be, you know, maybe places where a lot of people gather, um, you know, um, whether that's, you know, restaurants or, uh, you know, places of gathering, if there was something that you could see um, with our current, the current situation within, is that, is that a fair analogy to make? Yes, uh, like now, uh, the pandemic is so huge that uh, I wouldn't suggest to, to do it by uh, pop level, but you can start with do it by, by something like uh, uh, regions, which region is more affected than the other. And it's definitely worth trying to, to l- take a look at where are the cases and can I see something in that? Uh, can I see patterns in it? And when you, when you have the patterns, you can uh, probably make more decent decisions. And it's not always necessary to, to do it nationwide, maybe. Maybe it is, but you uh, can't assume that it's always the best thing. Because when there are no cases or almost no cases in the north of the country, uh, you don't have to be so strict in the north as, let's say, in London or which other place when you have more cases uh, of uh, COVID. And that's that's so in, so like interesting because we just had an announcement today here in the UK where we're going from a national lockdown back to a more regional approach. Mm-hmm. I wonder, and I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. Like, what you know, do, do you believe that there was GIS activity taking place to help our decision makers make those decisions? Uh, maybe it's naive uh, what I say, but I can't believe that they won't use it. So basically, I, I, I can't believe that that very poor country somewhere far away won't use it, but I think Western countries will use uh, GIS analysis for making decisions. But sometimes you will be surprised uh, about how little knowledge, knowledge there is about GIS. <laughs> also with government and those kinds of instances. So. Well, I will say that when I was listening to the ministers talk today, they did they did share about how they had different data sets that they were bringing together to make the decisions they made about the tiering levels. So I would imagine maybe yeah. that was shared in a way that was on GIS. Yeah, because may, when, you, when someone say, well, we use data, you probably think, oh, they've got big tables with, with numbers in it, but you can't uh, really read uh, a table quickly. Always when you see a table, it will take you lots of time to understand what's standing and you won't see any connections. Well, when you take a look at a map of Jon Snow, in in a second you see where the problem is. Well, when you have the same data in in a a, uh, spreadsheet, it will take you days. Yeah, your eyes just blur from all the numbers. Yes, you, you can't see, focus on everything. And when you only have to focus on a color or something like that, it's, it's much easier. So there must, there must be a psychology around that to some degree. I mean, I, you know, if that's the way our, our minds work, we need to see in order to believe versus just numbers on a sheet. Yeah, I think that has something to do with, uh, with history, that, that we are... Living, we were living in the wild and our eyes were protecting us from danger. So in a split second, you had to make a decision if it was safe or not uh, yeah. to stay in place. And I think that something has something to do with it. Ah, makes sense. Well, yeah. you know what? I think the next thing would be, be interesting to, to talk about now is that, you know, we've, you know, looking at this, this example that you provided, this was, this was back in the 1800s. And, you know, fast forward, we now have so much more data. We have satellite data, aerial data, et cetera. Um, and I, what I'd like to get into is kind of, well, what, do, what do you need to get started? And before, before you answer that question, just want to say a quick word to the audience um, that's out there. 
So uh, Marielle will be with us for the next, you know, half an hour or so. Uh, so if you have questions, if things interest you that come up, go ahead and share those with us. Uh, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can uh, before our time runs out. Uh, but yeah, just to plug about that, but back to what, what do we need? Um, Be before what you, uh, what we're going to discuss what you need, I want to show that people are using GIS more than they think. Okay. I have got a sheet about that. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, here, we'll put that the up. Way, do you use it? Like on the left, you see like a weather online the pictures where you see where the rain is uh, going, eh, where, where the thunderstorms are going or something like that. That's the way you are using GIS. Uh, in the middle, there's an there's a old map uh, from uh, March about corona deaths per, mil, uh, per million. Uh, so you can see immediately that Italy and Spain were a problem in, uh, in March. And the one on the right, you see a picture of Google Maps, and uh, there's a, a man walking with a, a little cart uh, filled with uh, cell phones. When you have uh, turned on your Google Maps and you want to find the best route to go from A to B, you can see where there are traffic jams. And the guy over there, he loaded this cart with 99 cell phones. And he started walking through Berlin. And the red dot you see on, on uh, the map, that's the office of uh, Google Maps. And he's walking by, creating a traffic jam because 99 cell phones were passing by very slowly. So Google uh, thought there was uh, a traffic jam going on. Wow. That's that's so, hilarious. That's hilarious. And so he's creating uh, Google traffic jams. By the way, Google is using your cell phone data to, to provide everyone uh, of traffic data. So, so are you telling me that Google Maps in and of itself with the, with the traffic jam, this is GIS? This is That's GIS, yes. And that so everything which has a location, you can say almost, almost everything which has a location is GIS. Wow. Wow. And, and we can also, we can mess with Google if we really want to, by if, yeah. we, if we happen to have 99 phones lying around. Yes. Yeah. He's an artist, so he does it as an art project, but yeah, you can. Absolutely. Wow. Brilliant. <laughs> so so this is location. just the way. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you see how easy I like, like them. Uh, the one in the, the map in the middle is the one you see in the newspapers or on the news. The one on the left, you're probably checking uh, when you go out, uh, how do I have to bring my umbrella or not? And how many people are using uh, Google Maps? I think almost everyone. So, But you also must be aware that they're also collecting your data. Well, you are not aware of it. So... So they, they be careful. They know everything of you, so <laughs> careful. Awesome. Well, these are some of the examples that I think a lot of us are familiar with. I mean, maybe we didn't yes. know it was called GIS, but we use these things. Um, so it'll be really interesting as we kind of go through and talk a little bit more about some of the, the examples that, um, that maybe people haven't thought of or don't realize that we're using. So, so to, but, but to kick that off, what, what are the things that we need? What kind of brings everything together? I think you brought oh. a picture to show us about that. Yes. And uh, first of all, it's very handy to have a computer because uh, nowadays we have plenty of data. And of course we need data and that's what you see uh, on top. It can be a table, it can be uh, a data set uh, from the internet. It can be satellite data. It can also be data collected by uh, by yourself with your cell phone. Okay. Uh, I go tell you something about that later. And finally, uh, yeah, we make maps. So that's on the bottom right. But but how do you make a map out of data? That's that's always a tricky thing. And I always use uh, QGIS. That's the logo you see uh, on the bottom left. 
Uh, it's a free and open source uh, software program. So everyone, all the viewers can, can download it and, and start using it if they want to. Because then you can make your own maps. And that's pretty nice. It can be very impressive. <laughs> and, and it's free. Anybody can go get it. Yes, it's free. Can you repeat yeah. the name again? What is it called again? QGIS. QGIS. All right. Yes, so I, uh, there's a link uh, later on. Oh, great. Um, you can, and we'll yes. that link in our description in the video. Yes, and you will also find plenty of tutorials of how to use it. Uh, starting with it is, is always a little tricky because you don't know where to start and you don't want to start with a, a tutorial which is too hard for a beginner. So always be very careful on, on which videos you start watching and which one you wait a little while for a year or something like that. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. So, computer, QGIS, you need some and data, data, satellite, yes. and then you can make these these kind of gorgeous maps. So, so, Absolutely. so, what's next? Uh, should we talk about some of these cool maps that you can make? What are some of these other examples that you you, you brought to show us today? I I, uh, I have uh, some examples. You, so you can show the one probably of the catchment area of the literal of the river. All right, here we go. Yes, uh, I, I made uh, a picture of uh, the Thai uh, basin, of uh, the catchment area of it. And uh, a catchment area is uh, actually uh, the area where the water is being collected, which will flow to the river. Okay. And uh, I, I went to the internet and I found a nice uh, elevation model. It's a, uh, just a, a TIFF file and uh, there are plenty of sites to find them. And this one I used uh, USGS Earth Explorer. It's, it's an American site. And uh, there you download the picture, you put it in QGIS. And after some hard work, <laughs> you get a picture on the right. This is how uh, experts can use a simple image on the left to, to make a nice picture on the right. That, that's very short uh, way. Uh, so you take uh, the left picture, you determine the elevation. That's what you can see that are the, the colors on the right hand side and uh, then you're starting to to do some uh, analysis and one of the analyses is when you take a look at a river uh, you can see it as a trunk of a tree with branches on the side and twigs on the very end and uh, how thinner the river is like a twig there's just one end going. When two twigs come together, it's becoming a little thicker. Then we call it Strahler 2. There are Strahler numbers from, from everything. And then you go down to the trunk and the trunk has the biggest number because the most branches are coming together. And that's what I did with the river. And uh, some you only see cracks in the ground, but I determined, oh, starting from number five or number six, six is becoming a river or it's becoming water. And I collected it together and then you got a Thai basin on the picture you see on the right. No, well, the picture looks, looks just fabulous that you see on the right. <laughs> and I think what's going on in my head, and I'm guessing that's going on in the audience, is says, well, it looks beautiful and I can kind of tell it's a river and I can... You know, probably figure out that there's mountains, but but why? What what would I use this for? What's the why would or, or who would this be for? And who, what would they do with this information? Uh, when you have uh, like a council or an environmental group, uh, it, they can use it for when there is, for example, uh, a problem with pollution or with farming, uh, like like. For example, the River Thai is, is polluted 
And where can we find the source? When you know what the basin is, you know where to start looking uh, for the source of the pollution. That's the way. Uh, <coughs> when you want to give uh, permission for, let's say, um, uh, an industry uh, to, to establish themselves somewhere, uh, do you want to do it in a, in a vulnerable uh, environment with, I don't know, the, the river tie, if it, it's very vulnerable or not, but let's say it is, then you don't want to be it in the basin. You want to do it somewhere else at a less vulnerable uh, river, or maybe you use a river like Thai for plenty of drinking water. When you use it for that, you don't want certain industries uh, in the near of the river. And here you can more and more precisely determine what the area is which will be uh, affecting uh, the river uh, quality. Okay, wow. So there's like, it sounds like there's a lot of uses. Um, I mean, this, that, that's fascinating. Now, I think another question that might be going on in people's minds is when, you know, you have this, this kind of picture on the left that I mean, frankly, to me, looks kind of like a brain. It doesn't really look <laughs> like a bunch of rivers. So, so tell what what is that picture on the left? What is that, and how is that what helps you make this useful product? Yeah, uh, on the left, uh, it's SRTM. It stands for Shuttle Radio Radar uh, Topography uh, Mission Pictures. So. Um, it's a satellite image of, uh, about height. So it's collecting the elevation of the surface. And uh, the lighter the image is on the left, uh, the higher uh, the elevation. So like the mountains, uh, the top of the mountain is wide, while the bottom of the mountain is dark. The rivers are, yeah, you could say, uh, black blackish and and water is always flowing from high to low except in the netherlands but in all the rest of the world water is flowing from high to low and uh, when water is flowing like that you, you can use a qgis to make pictures on the right wow amazing amazing and that came from space so so we're using space data to help help create these things that we use here on Earth. Absolutely fascinating. Yes. Yeah, you have some other examples that you could uh, you could show us. How else do we do we use GIS? Uh, one of the other examples I have is about trees. Yeah. Uh, this is the one I, I uh, use it with children during uh, the first lockdown. My daughter was at home and uh, she had some homework, of course, but uh, you know how it works. They have homework and after an hour they are completely finished and you want to do your work too. And my husband was at home and he had to teach uh, online. So it was kind of hectic only with one child, but they want attention. So uh, I wanted to, to learn something about uh, data collecting. So I made a template in QGIS and I put it in the cloud. She downloaded uh, an input app. It's called Input. So uh, it's also a free uh, app and you can use that to collect data. So I, I made a, like a worksheet for her, uh, which she had to fill in outside with the cell phone. And at home we have a lot of uh, fruit trees. So she went outside uh, for almost a day with her cell phone. She went to a tree, uh, pressed the button, like here's a tree, and then she got a, a survey. What kind of tree is it? Uh, how old is it? Because we had the paperwork of it. What kind of tree is it? When she was finished, she uploaded her data into the cloud. And I downloaded uh, in QGIS and I make the picture on the right with our part of our fruit trees. So that's, that's a very nice way to involve children because you can use it in plenty other ways. I, I use it around my house because we couldn't go anywhere, so it must be creative. And um, 
but you can also use it in, in school situations. Uh, involve the children in the area around school. Uh, where is the garbage? Uh, where is vandalism? Uh, which things are demolished? Uh, let them make a picture of it. And the picture can also be shown in the QGIS uh, map. So you have all the data collected together and even children can work with QGIS uh, to analyze the data till a certain level, of course. But when you, when you send the class out with their cell phone, because every child nowadays has a cell phone, cell, uh, cell phone after a certain age, when you send them outside, they can play with their cell phone in a useful way and collect all the data together. And probably you'll find... Uh, let's say, uh, dangerous spots, uh, if people feel uncomfortable or, uh, let's say, uh, broken uh, light poles or, or something like that. Well, th this, is, this is amazing. So you can get kids at such a young age involved in GIS and using... Um, using their their mobile phones. You know, we, we, you know I've, I've got a child too, and you know, they spend a lot of time on the screens. Uh, but this could be a great way to actually encourage encourage kids to think about GIS, think about science, think about maths. Um, yeah, for for young children, and I mean young children, the age uh, twenty and younger, <laughs> uh, they are so familiar with things like a Google Maps, a weather online. They never question themselves. How do they get the data? Hmm. How is it collected? And when you let them collect it by themselves, they, they probably be more critical about it because you can also make a funny exercise out of it by collecting fake data. Hmm. So there are plenty of, of ways of using it and involving not only children, but also civilians, uh, with government issues. Not just studying from behind your desk when you are an, a government uh, employee, but why don't you ask the people in your, let's say, uh, council or, or neighborhood or whatever uh, to, to uh, collect data of places where they feel good or they feel ugly about or whatever you want to investigate. I mean, this is, this is fascinating. So, you know, at Space Store, we like to, to involve people in experiences. We, we have people do getting in spacesuits and then virtual reality. We have people build little satellites. Um, I mean, the, you're opening up a whole new world of the potential that we could get people involved. In collecting data and using that data with satellite data and seeing how we could make make our neighborhoods even a better place by what yes, you know, yes. where where are places that we you know could improve um, th this is this is brilliant and how how have you is there a, this this project you did with your daughter is this something that our viewers at home could just do themselves yes they can after a little practice of course but. Uh... Of course, you also will find a lot of uh, good tutorials about using the input app uh, together with QGIS. First, I would say start with QGIS before you want to make uh, an input uh, project because you first have to know the, the basics. But there are really good examples of tutorials in English because most of them are in English. I also have my own YouTube channel, but it's in Dutch if you want to uh, watch that, you're more than welcome, and uh, you can choose for subtitles, so then you still know what's going on, but it's always easier to listen in your own language. Well, that, I mean, this would be a good time maybe to, to uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back at the end to talk a little bit more about your YouTube channel, but what, what are the things that, you know, people could watch on your YouTube channel? Is it more about... <laughs> Kind of more tutorials, more different ways you can use GIS? I uh, mainly have QGIS tutorials and some uh, database uh, tutorials because it's not only QGIS and mapping what you do, but you can also specialize 
uh, in GIS. Uh, some people go more to the technical direction and start programming uh, a lot. Uh, other ones only uh, do cartography. Uh, there are several ways to specialize in it. But most of my tutorials are uh, about using QGIS. Awesome, awesome. Also oh. for, for very new um, users. So, so everybody that's listening needs to, you know, download QGIS. Go of course. Mariella on her, on her uh, YouTube channel, you'll learn more about. Uh, and there are plenty of other people providing very, very good uh, tutorials. Like uh, I know Hans van de Kwast, he's a Dutch guy who has really good tutorials. He also uh, wrote a book about uh, catchment areas and those kind of things of rivers. He's a hydrology uh, specialist. Uh, but uh, there's a Swedish guy named Klaus Carlson. He's very good too. Uh, he has very nice tutorials. So it's really worth taking a look at that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, um, we're, we're starting to get questions coming in. So before we jump into those questions, maybe we, we have time for one more example that you could share uh, with our audience. Something else that you find just fascinating about. Uh, the trees, please. Oh, the trees. The tree monitor, yes. All right, we were talking about this one a little bit before. Uh, absolutely fascinating. So, so what is it that we're looking at here? A lot of dots. <laughs> what What in the world are these dots? <laughs> dots but you said uh, trees. I don't see any trees here. Yeah, they are trees uh, in my hometown, and uh, in November started the thirty day map challenge on Twitter and. Uh, I thought, oh, I will, I will join it. And I tried to make a map every day. So uh, one of the first map I made was a map of my hometown. Um, and someone uh, reacted. I did one with uh, the buildings and uh, the building period of each house. It's an open data set, so I, I used that one. And uh, some guy, uh, Dirk Foots, he was... Um, Making a comment on my map, he said, oh, it would be nice when you combine it with trees. I thought, oh, that's nice with trees, but I don't have the data source with all the trees in it because it's impossible to collect all the trees. And he's, I told him, yeah, I would like to do it, but I don't have the data. I said, oh, I will send it to you. And actually, uh, he's working at a... a at a company named Cobra Groen Inzicht, and they uh, developed the tree monitor. And with uh, like, I thought it was 12 different data sources, like satellite images, 3D uh, uh, aerial photographs, infrared pictures. Uh, they determined the trees where they are, all by remote sensing. The height of the trees, the, the, the size of the rooftop, uh, the, the, the diameter of the trunk, the, the, the root systems, the type of tree, uh, the age they were planted, approximately. And the map you see over here are uh, the years the trees were planted. And uh, the lighter the dot, the older the tree. So the yellow dots are very old trees before uh, the Second World War. Uh, you can even see the, the shape of our town, original shape, like the, the, the star shape. And that's very beautiful, of course. But it's amazing how detailed the map is because they also have the pictures of trees uh, they collected the data of the trees in people's house uh, in backyards. So all the trees are in there. And at the bottom of the, the picture, you see the forest behind my house. And even there, all the trees are in there. It's all done by machine learning. So uh, he'll have his quad and he drives into the forest uh, collecting some trees and learning uh, the machine, the computer, uh, which tree is 
which and the other trees he can do it by himself. And now it's about 75% accurate for the types of trees. And there are still sometimes weird things in it because I figured out that we have a tree growing in our house. So there are also little problems with it, but it's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that sometimes the data, data needs a little bit of help to, to, yes. to be corrected. Yeah, you, you, it's an ongoing process. So when you see mistakes, you use that to make the machine smarter. So, so this, this map, I, I find it really intriguing because, well, first of all, it's, it's beautiful, it's interesting. And like you said, if you, if you, you can see the outline of maybe the, the older town because of the older trees, um, mm -hmm. which is, is, is so neat. So what, what, are, the, what are the things that, that people use this map for? Do, do people, um, you know, what are the applications? Who, who might actually use this and then make a decision and do something? Yeah, like uh, there's a lot about the environment nowadays, of course. Uh, and you need a certain amount of green in your area to have a healthy environment. So if you have a lot of industry, you need more trees. In this data set, it's also uh, like a carbon uh, dioxide equivalent of each tree is calculated. So you know what your total storage of carbon dioxide can be. This must be uh, in balance with the uh, CO2 produced by your area. So you can figure out, oh, do I need more trees? Where do I need more trees? Uh, is it enough? Is it not enough? Uh, which trees are in a worse condition because when, when I take a look at trees uh, next to my house, uh, they are very old, but also not in a good shape anymore. I know they were planted in uh, 86, uh, but it's a fast growing tree and they normally uh, don't grow older than 30 years because then they become dangerous. And the tree monitor says it's like, 70 years old. That means that it's a really bad condition. Hmm. So wow. in combination with the type of tree, you, you can make the decision, ooh, when, when it's that old and it's that type of tree, we need to cut it down before any accidents happen. And then we plant something new. Or I don't know if you have um, had problems with... Um, the caterpillars in the oaks? I don't know. Uh, caterpillars in the oak trees, you mean? Yes. Did you have those problems? Uh, you know, I don't know if we do here in uh, the... Probably U not, because if, if you had one, you know, we have one. Well, uh, back when I lived in America, we did. So, yeah. yes. Uh, those caterpillars, they only live in, live in oak trees, and they got long hairs, and uh, they burn on your skin. Ooh. So they, in the last two years, they were really doing a lot of prevention. So when they saw a, a group of, ca of those caterpillars, they destroyed them. But it's easy when you know where the oak trees are. And you can just say, oh, give me all the oak trees. And then you can say, oh, I go check over there. And you don't have to go to areas where there are no oak trees. For something like that, you could use it too. Are diseases happening in some trees? Uh, I mean, it's amazing. You've just described like five or six different things that we can use this map to, to yeah. help, help our society, help our community, make our community a better place to live. This is, this yes. is, this is great. Well, um, we're getting close to the end of our, our time. So I want to give, uh, give a, a couple questions to you from the audience and then mm -hmm. we'll wrap up and we'll do a, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the other uh, resources that people uh, can look at. Um, so I've got one question in here, um, which maybe it's maybe it's from a kid. I don't know. Uh, maybe you've inspired some of the young people. But it is GIS what allows for Pokemon Go? Um, I know yes. we might have played, and I know my uh, we've also played Minecraft Earth. Um, yeah, what is that? What GIS allows? 
Uh, yes, because it's working on uh, GPS. Uh, the, the GPS in your telephone uh, is used during Pokemon Go. I've never played it, but I, I know a little bit how it works. But of course, people, uh, that, that's also using GIS, but not on the scientific way. Uh, <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> hey, G, you know, space for fun. There you go. Satellites for fun. GIS yes. for fun. There you go. A another fun way of, of using uh, the GPS, of course, is geocaching. Ah, so like the treasure hunts that people do. Yes, geocaching. yes. That's funny. I saw some people on uh, my street the other day. They must have been doing that because they were so excited to find something in a very <laughs> random bush. <laughs> so they okay. were cashiers, yes. <laughs> You go. So may, maybe uh, not as, as uh, fun of a question, but, you know, it, this this is an interesting one about um, can we use GIS to discover uh, maybe some complex social questions? So, for example, um, to map emotional anxiety around, say, an issue of a new building or uh, being put up or being brought down or, you know, a park being affected, yeah. um, can, can, can GIS be used in this way? Yeah, a few weeks ago, uh, I spoke to someone who, who were using uh, GIS for mapping emotions. So they so let people walking through Amsterdam, and uh, the longer they, they uh, stand still at a certain point, the stronger the emotion was felt. It was uh, like a, uh, an investigation uh, for... for how emotions are, and th they got a task. You will uh, you will be mapping the emotion uh, anxiety. So they were walking through Amsterdam, and when they're feeling a little bit excited, they st uh, stopped and they stayed on a certain place. And the slower they walked, or the longer they stood still, the wider the the road uh, became on mm -hmm. her map. So she could map where are the places where you can feel more anxiety or happiness or freedom or something like that. So this this might be a, a random question, but just as a follow on, that made me think, well, could you per, could you per se maybe take data from social media like, say, Facebook or Twitter and pull out keywords that might indicate anxiety in one case, or maybe happiness in another case, or anger in another case, and potentially geolocate that to a position and create create some sort of map. Uh, I think that's possible because uh, when you know, you mean the post is uh, done in, let's say London, then we go for the, the, the feeling, we, we attach it to London. That's uh, that's yeah, what you but, mean, yeah. Or, or, and, or, yeah, or let's say you're you you're looking at a map of London and um, in different parts. The of street London. or yeah, something yeah, and, like that. And, yeah. and people have like been typing, "Oh, I'm so happy," and you know we. So that's positive. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's possible because then you do some data mining, and data mining is is gathering information from internet sites. And that's even, uh, uh, there's big business. Have data is the new goal. So uh, data mining from the internet, collecting those data and selling it to other people. That, that's a very big business. And you can also use it for words as happy or something like that. Oh, okay. Because wow. then you're, you're, you're going around uh, Facebook and probably, I don't know, uh, but probably Facebook will also storage your location when you enter it. And if if that's so, absolutely, you can make a map out of it. <laughs> Basically, anywhere you take your phone and anything you do with your phone, you can make a map out of it. Sounds like yes. what you can do. Yes. Well, let's. Let's talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available and a little bit about, you know, how people learn more about you and what you do. Um, yeah. So I think you it's, provided some links, um, which I'll... Yeah, but first uh, you show the sheet with the, the, the slide with open data, okay. with that title, because I prefer using open data. Open data will say it's open to people, like most of the time it's government data. Yeah. 
uh, if you type uh, open data uh, Great Britain, you will find, you see many, many results, but a lot of data about your own area is open and you can use it, download it and, uh, and study it. So this is very uh, great to do and see what everything is written about in your country. Like all the details about uh, your house or something like that. Uh, you can probably find it all on the internet. Scary, but also maybe very helpful. So Yeah, great. very helpful because your council, for example, is collecting data, but other instance, uh, other uh, authorities can also use it and uh, if someone is planning to, to to build something somewhere it's also nice that they won't build it on the place where your house is located so it can make help you uh, by doing better decisions okay excellent so i know you've provided us a number of links that we're going to include in the yes. so that other people can get involved tell us a little bit more about um your uh, your talk show and uh, and your Twitter. How can people learn more? Uh, people can learn more uh, about me under the name uh, GeoYuffie on Twitter. Uh, I think you will put it on the screen a little later because I think it's very hard for a lot of people. For, for us English people, we're, we're not going to be able to... Uh, I, I would have no idea how to spell that. So how about I put uh, that up on the screen for people so they can see? Yeah, it's on the last slide under the same as, uh, uh, it's also known as GeoYuffy, the bottom one. There we go. Geo yes. Yuffie. Yeah, so when, you, when you Twitter that or when you, when you take a look at YouTube under that name, you will come to my uh, YouTube channel or on my Twitter account or something like that. And uh, the Grote Geo Show, the Big Geo Show. It's like uh, Space Tour Live. Uh, we have it in the Netherlands as uh, the open source community. We are all working with open source software. And uh, at the first lockdown, uh, everything was canceled. Like also the big hackfest in the Netherlands was canceled just a few days uh, in the first lockdown. Uh, so we started a, a broadcast, a weekly broadcast, 10 uh, in spring, and now we change to once every month. And it's not a heavy technical show, but we, we try to find a balance between fun and, and serious items. And it's about a one and a half hour with, with several items, a quiz, uh, a poem or a rap, uh, something creative, but all rela uh, related to geo. And next Thursday, we have our first pub quiz, geo pub quiz, with all geo related questions. So it's a big success. Well, you're going to get a lot of British people there because the Brits love uh, love a pub quiz, and at the moment we can't go to the pub. So <laughs> you're more than welcome to join us. You can can join join us at uh, tv. Uh, osgo. nl. Great, and we'll we'll include that in the bottom. Uh, yes. In, now tell so so is it in Dutch or do we get subtitles for those of us that don't speak Dutch? How? No, the the quiz will be totally in Dutch. But if you watch uh, like the November show, it's about map time, making maps. It's a very nice show. A big part of it is also in English. Great. So that's a nice one to, to watch back. And we had one in, uh, in spring with a lot of uh, uh, foreign guests like Anita Grazer, which is an authority uh, in the GIS world. So uh, she's also... Uh, doing the interview in English. Excellent. Okay, so there's some some of the, the uh, when people go to your YouTube station, they'll be able to see some things in English. And then is there some subtitles in some cases? Uh, on uh, subtitles you can always choose. I don't know if the quality is always great, but you can at least try it. There you go, there you go. Yeah. No, well, even, even subtitles that are in English, into English can be pretty funny sometimes when you watch them. Yes. Yes, 
No, I use automatic subtitles, but I know I have uh, viewers from uh, India and uh, they are enthusiastic about it. I don't know if it says something about the subtitles of about their English, because maybe the subtitles are made by Indian people, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think that a lot of it goes through uh, machine learning and basically yes, of course. just, just yeah. picking it up. So, wow, this has been absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, I obviously I love space. I, you know, uh, I work at Space Store, um, but I've learned so much from you, uh, Mario. This has been just absolutely uh, fascinating. Your passion is infectious. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you from uh, all of our audience, from myself, at Space Store for joining us tonight. And just to, to share a couple of uh, some cool announcements and things um, that we've got coming up. Uh, you know, So even though we've been in lockdown, there's still, we like uh, Mariella, we just want people to know space and experience space. Uh, check out our website, spacestore.co, and you can hear more about some of our experiences that you can even do online now. Uh, we'll actually send you some goodies, things like uh, meteorites, things from the beginning of the solar system, and uh, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and, and we'll send them to you and then we'll, we'll have, a, have an experience uh, online. Um, so we've got that coming up. We've got um, a new program coming up next week uh, called Accessing Space. So uh, definitely join us on Thursday night uh, where we're gonna start plunging into a series about um, how uh, the stories, the challenges, the achievements of different uh, people with different backgrounds, in particular from maybe uh, marginalized or underrepresented uh, groups, uh, to, to bring space to everyone. So come check that out. Um, a little bit of a teaser that we should be having an astronaut coming on our channel in the not too distant future, but I'll just kind of leave it there. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, and I, I thought it'd be, be nice to share one, one thing uh, with everybody. One of our uh, partners uh, with Space Store is a, is a company called Ocean Mind. And Ocean Mind um, is, is also a GIS company. Um, you may have heard of them, Mariella, but they, it, you, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, we can use satellites um, to track uh, illegal fishing and find out where, where things are not going right on our oceans. And Ocean Mind, one of our partners, actually uh, fits really well into to this discussion tonight. They uh, they basically combat illegal fishing uh, using satellites. So it's great that that we have them on board. Go check them out at our website. You can buy some of their, you can buy t-shirts, you can buy pins. Uh, they, they've got lots of cool gear you can get on our website. And part of the proceeds from Ocean Mind actually go to um, uh, uh, marine protected areas and keeping our oceans uh, biodiverse. Uh, so um, so again, uh, Maria, uh, um, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. We uh, we've just had a blast with you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. It was the pleasure was mine. So thanks a lot. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have you back. Uh, I know who I'm going to call when I have uh, some GIS and map questions. Uh, thanks Great. so much for bringing <laughs> GIS down to a level that everybody can understand. I'm going to be sharing this video with all my friends and family. So. Um, uh, thank you again. And thanks to everybody that's joined us tonight from uh, YouTube. Uh, we hope you have a good evening. Stay safe. And